All right, well, thank you. Um, hopefully this is as close as I can get to this fly. So hopefully shows up well on your screen there. Um, so this is a fly that I have been tying for probably close to 10 years now. As you can see, it's tied with dumbbell eyes. So I'm gonna contradict Terry a little bit here. Um, and a lot of that is to compensate for people that show up with the wrong fly lines. Um, if you have a proper sinking line or sink tip or fishing different sections of river, uh, you could get away with no weight or, or a bead head, but the dumbbell eyes kind of take that all out of the equation, which uh, I think is nice. Um, but like Terry, chartreuse seems to be the go-to at all times for me. So the bulk of the flies I tie are gonna be chartreuse, pink, oranges work well, uh, white and reds, um, but I think more than what the fish want, it's a confidence game. So I don't know, chartreuse ends up on my rod at the beginning of the year and usually stays on it throughout. So this is a Mustad number four hook. Um, a number four is about as big as I'd go. Uh, sixes are just fine as well. Uh, the first step is to get lead eyes tied on here. And this is just a size small lead eye, but you could use a couple different sizes, get a couple different weights, just depending on what depth you're fishing or what line you might have or how much current there is. And current often changes, changes several times a day based on tide. If you have an incoming tide, it's gonna start slacking the current and outgoing tide is gonna pick up, pick up the current. So really different weights of your flies, different different weights of your fly line you could use throughout the course of six hours on the river um, just to adjust to conditions. Uh, so lead eyes first on this one. I like these painted lead eyes with the black uh, dot on there. A little bit of contrast is very important. I do like chartreuse. I do like a lot of flash, but I think contrast is extremely important. When the river gets a little murky, I'll actually start tying in more black or painting black on some of my spinning rods or spinning shad darts. Um, so after the eyes are on there, we go to your tail. I use this Krennic stuff, uh, Flashaboo works just fine. Anything flashy, really. Uh, I have this stuff lined up in a tube here to the length that I wanna cut. So I don't have to even, it just takes that out of the equation for me. And I'm gonna, let's see if we can see this here. I have a pinch in my fingers here. Just gonna lay it against the fly line or the, the thread here and just fold it over, slide it down and just kind of capture it and just wrap it down the shank of the hook here. And I start right behind the eyes. So I have a level wind across this entire hook. If you just tie it to the back, you're gonna have a little bulge at the back and it's gonna affect the body of the fly. And I just want everything to be kind of uniform across. Uh, like Terry, I will agree that shad are infamous short strikers. So I think a short tail is extremely important. Um, I have my material here set for that length. So I do not have, I don't even have to cut it after I'm done. So I'm happy with that. Uh, a lot of people will fish, will just kind of settle and fish a small clouds or minnow for shad and you will catch fish, but I guarantee you, you are getting a lot of swing and misses um, that you don't even really know about because they're just nipping at the end of that. And some of the smarter people will cut those clousers down just so it's not, so the bucktail isn't going over the bend of the hook. But I think a short tail is important. Uh, my next step is to tie in a vinyl D-rib. It comes on a spool like this. It's called D-rib, the cross section, which you will not be able to pick up from my screen is just the shape of a D. And the material is vinyl, obviously. And this, I use it in clear because you can kind of pack in whatever color underneath and turn it to whatever you want. They do make different colors of this, like pink, red, um, and others. I'm gonna wrap that down, starting right at the base of the eyes again, just so I have a uniform body coming down. And you could wrap this around right now if you'd like, and you'd have a decent body on there. 
what I'm going to do, I'm going to add in a piece of diamond braid, flat diamond braid uh, in chartreuse. This has a little bit of sparkle in it and will just help reflect light a little bit better in the water. Again, coming down from the base of the eye and wrapping down to the start of the tail. And so now I have kind of two materials going here. I'm gonna back my thread up to the eyes again. I'm gonna do my wrap with this diamond braid and just tie that off. And one nice thing about this D-rib is it's gonna help you build profile. Uh, this is a little bit skinny right now. It just doesn't do much for me when it's in the water. So this D-rib will just bolster that body a little bit here um, and also help reflect some light for you. So that's tied up just at the base of the eyes. And the next step, and so where that where that um, diamond braid is in, you could use anything from like a gold tinsel. You could just use thread. Um, you could use a lot of different things. So it's it's um, pretty flexible there, and you could probably just make do with whatever's in your box. So I just have just this is a medium chenille in chartreuse. They make a million different chenilles um, that Estes stuff. And you could use anything in its place here, including dubbing. But I'm gonna to come towards the eye of the hook and just kind of capture that end. I pinched off to just expose the core of that. I'm gonna capture that with the thread. And the best way that I can describe this is kind of a three-dimensional three dimensional figure eight, if you will. I'm gonna wrap over the eyes, under the eyes, back over the eyes and then I'm back under the hook and I can tie it off. And I like to operate with a big tag end here. I just, um, and that way when I'm done, I can hold it back out of my way and just kind of tie off just like that. Um, and so I get a nice clean head on that fly. Couple more turns. A whip finish or two and you're done. Alex, we have a, a few questions here for you. Uh, what rod weight and sink tip weight do you recommend for chasing Chad? Uh, so anything between a six to an eight weight, I think a seven weight is the universal kind of thought on it. Uh, a big American Chad on a six weight is going to give you, you know, give you quite a fight. But um, I think a seven weight just throwing these sinking lines and with American Chad mixed in with the hickories, I think just a seven weight is a great universal rod for that. And I'm sure there'll be people touching on that later on in this. But as far as line weight, uh, Terry, I know where he fishes, that sinking tip is going to be just fine in that shallow water he's fishing maybe eight to 10 feet, but you could find yourself in 15 feet, no problem. So 250 to 350 grain. And as I said earlier, the current changes on an hourly basis based on tides. So you have to make adjustments while you're going along, but I think a seven weight with, you know, anything 250 to 350 is what I recommend. Um, and, you know, weighted flies, they come, I time, that's about all the colors you'd ever need there. Um, but my box is filled with these are also some weightless ones, uh, just in case you find yourself on one of these late May days where there's very little flow, um, just conditions change all the time and you got to be ready for it. That's great. And, uh, Alex, before we, before we, uh, turn over to the next presenter, could you speak a little to, uh, the spoon side of things? using a shad spoon, silver, gold. So spinning, yeah, so spinning tackle. Yeah. Uh, okay, so spinning tackle, uh, just from the top, starting from the top here, as far as your rod and reel, you want like a light action to medium light. Braided line is 
just your line choice on spinning tackle is just as important to me as your line choice on fly tackle. Braided line sinks faster and casts farther. So a four to a six pound test braided line, uh, I find very important. A monofilament won't cast as far, it's not gonna sink as fast. Once you have all that, your shad dart choices, spoon choices, you're still trying to get down in the water column. A shad spoon by itself will not be heavy enough to sink. So if you're gonna use a shad spoon, you're gonna need a rig that will include some weight, either a split shot or an inline sinker of some sort or a double rigged shad dart uh, with something a little bit heavier. Um, but gold, silver, a lot of times that's just, again, it's a confidence thing. I find so many people coming up to the shop and they'll only want to buy silver spoons because they had a day where they caught a hundred chat on a silver spoon. And they will not change their ways. And that's fine because they're confident in it and that's what works for them. But a lot of things, a lot of things really do work. Um, gold, probably better in murkier water, silver better in, uh, clear water just to get to that specific question. Awesome. And Alex, can you just show us those fly colors one more time? Yep. So kind of chartreuse, always a good standard. Same with pink, uh, a little bit of black dot on the eyes just for some contrast. Uh, the orange flies are a, historically a great kind of murky water color, a little bit of gold in there. That uh, white and red is a great clear water color. And again, not to give away too many secrets here, but when the water gets murky and I'm, at least when I'm spin fishing, I will literally come home and just dip my stuff in black paint because it really just shows up a lot better. And nobody ever thinks to use black when chat fishing because we sit here and we preach chartreuse and flash and all of that, but you gotta be willing to experiment sometimes. And Terry using purple flies, that's it's just, you know, that kind of speaks to that same train of thought. That's awesome.